Good morning, and welcome to another podcast from A Practiced Life, examining the habits and routines of um, humanity. What does it What does it mean to be living a good life? The daily bits and pieces that add up. I was thinking earlier this morning that um, the the concept of ethics, we think of ethics, I think of ethics as being um, prescriptive good and bad. I see ethical scenarios with uh, thought experiments about if you could save one person or five people, if you could divert a trolley that was going to run over one person that you knew or five people that you didn't know, which would you choose? Things like that are posited as ethical dilemmas. But I, um, as I'm reading more Stoicism, as I'm reading more about Stoics, and as I'm including sort of reflections from Aurelius and Seneca into my daily journaling practice, in addition to the mindful stillness practices that I that I bring on the cushion, I'm also trying to be more disciplined about um, self-scrutiny through journaling. The, the Stoics talk about ethics as the good life. What is it? What the question is? What is a good life? And um, the answer seems to be in the habits and and practices that we engage in moment by moment. And an awareness. Well, an awareness rose in me this morning. Maybe that's a, a bit of a convoluted piece of language, but you know, we have puppies. I mentioned last time that my normal routines have been wildly disruptive. I'm recording this in the kitchen. You can see cattle behind me, various um, kitchen detritus behind me. And that's because the puppies are sleeping down here and they're only tiny wee little things. So. I want to spend time with them, make, and I don't just want to put them in their sleeping pen. So, so they're out. They're actually sleeping um, under the table right now. And when I was meditating earlier, I'm meditating in the kitchen. So for a period of time now into some point in the future, my routine is meditating in the, in the kitchen. If you'd asked me two months ago if I wanted to sit down and meditate in the kitchen, I would have said no. There's people in and out. We have a couple of house guests right now. Um, all of that, the puppies running around, and then the puppies not running around. They, they come and sit on my knees. That's a display of energy. It is the unfolding of the moment. And that unfolding moment is shaped by the routines that I am trying to put in place. And it occurred to me that those routines are not permanent. I have a habit of thinking this routine is the routine that I will stick to every day. And there's sort of an unspoken assumption that that's a perpetuity. This is the right thing to do, and it's the a good life and I will continue to do it but it really struck me that this particular phase of my routine won't last probably won't last more than another six weeks or so the dogs will get bigger they won't be able to curl up on my knees while I'm meditating they may choose to sit with me while I meditate which would be fucking delightful like that will, I'm cultivating that in them but perhaps we'll move upstairs once they're a little bit bigger and they'll sit with me in my uh regular meditation space. So that awareness that the puppies running around and then sitting with me is a moment that won't last more than a month or two, 
and then they'll be bigger and it will be different. Those are the kinds of mundane basic realizations that start to fill out the wisdom of impermanence a as an experienced phenomena or as, or as an experience of phenomena. And I'm, wor I'm working on this in my, in my practice. When I apply scrutiny and investigation to my practice, so as opposed to the times when I'm sitting in concentration or sitting in, in stillness, there are times when I'm deliberately scrutinizing and deliberately investigating. At the moment, for this summer, the, the scrutinization of the experience of emptiness is sort of driving my thinking. The, there's a sort of state of equanimity that I get to in my meditation that is um, stable and is not concentration. It's an openness. And it, it's, I think, relatively stable. But the, the next depth from that point of equanimity is, is to, uh, I believe, actually observe or experience the attribute of emptiness of the phenomena. And right now I'm uh, thinking and investigating at a very gross level very large level, the idea of seeing 10 week old puppies running around and knowing that in three months they will be three months and 10 weeks old, which then they will be bigger and they will be behaving differently. And my routine that has shifted will shift again. That's a very broad noting of impermanence. And my thinking is that the noting should become smaller and smaller to the breath, to the subdivisions of the breath, down further until the moment itself is filled with so many particulates of note, all of which are formed from sense perceptions, all of which recognize the difference between emotion, thought, and sensation. And then in that moment, residing in the the emptiness. And again, I want to really stress that the word emptiness, the more I read and think and, and talk and study, emptiness is a very difficult translation um, because it doesn't imply at all unreal. There's no question about the reality. What it does question is the definition of reality, that the that the real is somehow permanent at any level, and that our task is to scrutinize that moment, come to an understanding and a perception of that. And then what? So the note that I had in my journal to start for today was the word compassion is the activity of emptiness, which again comes from those Joseph Goldstein lectures on mindfulness that I've been really grooving on lately, just really getting into and getting a lot out of. I'm almost through my second listening of the entire set. It's about 40 hours of lecturing. It's fantastic. Compassion is the activity of emptiness. So with the immediate perception of the attribute of reality being impermanence, emptiness, what is there to do? Well, the stoic recommendation for routine, I think, is, is part of that. I think they arrive at it from a different set of metaphysics. They're arriving at it from an ethical question about the good life. You establish routines, and you establish those routines that cultivate compassion. Uh, Buddha cultivates compassion because and this is my understanding right now my interpretation because confronted with the 
understanding and experience of the impermanence of everything around. How else can you interact with them except with tenderness, compassion, and skillful means? I think the overlap between routine and skillful means is very resonant with me right now. And these are difficult. I mean, I, I've been trying to establish a routine for two weeks now and uh, had a lot to overcome. The idea of meditating in the kitchen, the floor is hard, I don't have my cushion. There are people in and out. But you know what, that's all in the display of the energy. Anyway, I think that's good for good for now. Um, keep your wits about you. Any questions, drop me a note, zenglop at gmail.com or just put a comment below. Subscribe, share this. If you've gotten to this point, um, you should forward the channel to two other people and uh, recommend that they also listen and subscribe. Um, beyond that, I will uh, try to be back on, on Thursday. Scheduling Tuesdays and Thursday. I figure if Marcus Aurelius can get up in the morning managing the Roman Empire during the Antonine Plague, I can get up and record a podcast twice a week.